Appalachian Harvest is a food hub located in Southwest Virginia that provides regional herb and vegetable farmers with training, technical support, aggregation, and distribution services, connecting them to retail markets. We currently source produce from farmers in Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia, Kentucky, and North Carolina. This webinar is made possible by Risk Management Agency 2018 Risk Management Education Partnership Program. So as we get started, what we're basically talking about this evening is integrated pest management. Uh, and sometimes you'll hear that referred to just as IPM. Uh, and basically it's a way to diversify your tactics of managing pests. Uh, and it's not just for insects or just for weeds or even uh, only plant diseases. It's actually any pest that we may have uh, within the agricultural production environment. Um, and so it combines a number of different methodologies to do that. So cultural, biological, and chemical practices are what we'll be focusing on tonight. Sometimes you'll see uh, cultural maybe broken down into mechanical practices, uh, particularly with things like uh, weed IPM, uh, because mechanical practices can have such an impact there. Um, What's good about IPM is it allows us to target specific pests. So uh, as we go through this evening, we'll be talking some, some about that uh, and, way, and why we may wanna target specific pests rather than using a broad approach. Um, also, it allows us to tailor our responses uh, to actions that are appropriate for the operation. So for instance, if a farm is certified organic, their response to a particular pest may be very different than a conventional farm. By the same token, large and small farms may have different resources available to them. And um, as a result of that, they may approach uh, managing that pest in a different manner. Uh, and what's great about IPM is it's not there's one answer that's correct. It's that there are a number of strategies that you can elect and you choose those that are best for your operation. So why are we worried about insects? Um, and probably most of this, uh, anyone on this webinar can understand and probably guess themselves. The very principal reason we're concerned with insects is the direct damage to our crops. And that really does two things mainly. One, it reduces the productivity of that crop. So we're not gonna see as high of yields. And the second thing, and somewhat related to reduce productivity, is also reduce quality. Particularly when we're dealing with commercial vegetables, uh, we're looking for product that is essentially as free as possible from any sort of defect. Very minor defects aren't a problem, but they do have to be very minor. And so even just a little bit of insect damage can sometimes be too much. So when we have direct feeding damage uh, on the fruit or the harvested portion of that crop, we have a very real issue in losing marketable uh, produce. Uh, and again, in general, when we have a plant that is being attacked by pests such as insects, we see that that plant typically does not thrive. So even if we are able to pull off quality produce, we're not gonna see the same numbers or quantities coming off of that planting. Another important thing that we have to consider is the transmission of diseases. We're not gonna focus on this a lot tonight. Uh, quite honestly, we'll probably have more about insects as the vectors or transmitters of diseases in our next presentation in the series. Uh, but we do want to be aware that insects can carry diseases. And so if we limit uh, their spread within our crops, we can help reduce the potential for some diseases. So it's important uh, to understand that factor. And another thing we have to realize is it can complicate our cells. And what I mean by that is um, there are any number of consumers that aren't going to be happy to buy near a sweet corn, pull back the husk and find a corn earworm. It's just a fact of life that if you're growing sweet corn, no matter what control program you have, you're not going to have 100% control. Uh, but realistically, there are a lot of consumers that are being very dissatisfied if they see that a lot. And obviously, buyers at the commercial level, if you're having issues like that where you're finding insects attached to or on or in the product that's being sold, uh, you're going to have dissatisfied buyers. So definitely maintaining a, a decent control program around insects can help make our sales picture a little bit easier uh, to deal with. One area that I think is key to beginning a good insect control program with integrated pest management is identifying insects. 
Um, part of it is we want to make sure we're protecting beneficial insects. So there's a lot of insects out in the environment that pose no threat to our crop and uh, they may actually be beneficial to us, either they're pollinators for our crop, which helps allow us for proper food set, or it could be they're actually predators that attack those insects that are damaging our crop. So identifying what insects are actually out there in our crops, what may be causing harm and what is no cause for concern is important. It also allows us to utilize the right control strategy. Uh, and by that, some products will only target certain insect orders or certain types of insects. And so if we misidentify a pest or if we're applying the wrong product to treat uh, a pest that we believe is there but isn't, we could at best be wasting our money and at worst actually making the problem uh, greater. So understanding what insects we're dealing with is key. And we'll have a few resources at the end that I'll point you to that I think are uh, very good for our region. And I think this is a good example of that. Uh, most everyone is familiar with the adult uh, ladybird beetle, or as most folks call them, ladybugs. It's very easy to identify. We know that it's a predator of things like aphids. So when we see those out in our crops, we're happy. Uh, but sometimes people are surprised to learn that on the right, we actually have a ladybird beetle larva, and it also feeds on uh, insects such as so maybe if folks aren't familiar with what the larval stage of the adult looks like, uh, they might be concerned to see uh, that on their crops. So understanding what's out there is important. And of course, uh, whether it's a predator that's uh, eating uh, harmful insects or it's uh, the harmful insect itself, knowing what we're dealing with is important. There are some actions we can do and should do under IPM before we get focused on things such as insecticides. Uh, and those are kind of lumped all together under preventative actions. Uh, one of the very basic ones is start with insect-free transplants if we're transplanting. Uh, typically, we don't see a lot of insects introduced into plantings from seed. I guess it's technically possible, but it's not common. Uh, one story I can tell you that actually happened when I was in college, as part of a uh, insect class, an entomology class, uh, we desi designed an experiment where we were looking at different methodologies for controlling cabbage loopers or cabbage caterpillars on cabbage plants. And so one of the treatments was actually putting them under a remake cage, just like you would with like a floating row cover, but they were cages because this was a very small plot that was being implemented. Uh, well, lo and behold, about half of those caged plots actually had damage from the uh, caterpillars. Uh, and what we finally decided on happened is it's common to actually harden off transplants and that's to actually place them outside of a greenhouse uh, during the day or during the night to help harden them off before they're transplanted out in the field. The greenhouse is a very um, inviting uh, environment for that transplant to grow and actually outdoors is a little harsh. So you gradually introduce that transplant to the outdoors and it hardens up or uh, and then when you transplant it it's less likely to have transplant shock it's better to take off and start growing well as best we could figure uh, when it was during that hardening off period uh, it was visited by either the butterfly or moths uh, that can lay those eggs uh, and of course that's where those caterpillars were coming from so sometimes you know it may be easier said than done to actually have insect free transplants because of course at that time there's no obvious damage on the transplants. It wasn't something anyone expected, um, but things like that can sometimes happen that may surprise you. So you can actually introduce uh, insects on transplants, even if it's not readily apparent. Another practice that's important is sanitation. Uh, and we'll repeat this again when we talk about plant diseases. Uh, and sanitation basically is just a removal of things such as uh, crop debris and stuff of that nature. Uh, one of the key reasons we do that is to prevent overwintering of insect pests. So there are any number of uh, insects that are actually overwintering as adults. And whenever we allow crop residues to remain and just stay there until the next season, uh, we make it easier for them to overwinter. So being able to either remove those from the growing environment, turning them under with tillage or things of that nature, help prevents the carryover. Um, Another big key is just healthy crops withstand insect pressure better. Uh, it, it goes without saying that if we have uh, crops that are uh, planted in a 
reasonable time frame for what they are, properly fertilized and irrigated, they're better able to resist damage from insects. And basically, if we don't have that, if we have crops that are stressed, we basically are going to see those impacts multiply because they're less able to withstand the pressure. Crops actually have ways they can fight back against certain uh, insect damage or predation. Uh, and when we don't have crop, healthy crops there, they're unable to do that. And a very key preventive action is crop rotation. Uh, and we'll actually talk about that uh, additionally more uh, later on. And one thing I wanted to mention under uh, cultural controls, um, floating row covers. Uh, and this was actually a picture I found, uh, believe it or not, out of uh, Alaska. And they were actually in the picture using this, not for insect control or anything like that, but actually to keep uh, deer from browsing or eating on the plants. Uh, so sometimes exclusion may apply more than just insects. But floating row covers are something that are commonly promoted with organic production and they work very well provided you use them correctly. Um, and the other time we see exclusion as a very highly effective option is in greenhouses. Um, so insect netting over uh, openings uh, where we're letting fresh air in. Uh, it's not uncommon to see some greenhouses, particularly things like tomato greenhouses or the like that have um, crops in them for long periods of time. They actually may be under positive pressure uh, and generally you'll see a large air intake, very large, and it sort of looks like a big netted cage. Uh, and what it is, that netting is actually screening out insects so they're not introduced into the environment. So exclusion can work with insects, but lots of times on a commercial scale, we find that floating row covers and things of that nature are cost prohibitive, not to mention the management of having to open those up during certain times and then recover. Uh, but they are something that can be used on a smaller scale. Under cultural control, there's basically four strategies that we implement. Uh, one of those is uh, limiting pest habitat. Uh, the second would be choose planting activities to frustrate the pest, and we'll explain what that really means. Uh, the third would be luring pests away from the crop, and the fourth would be reducing the impact of the injury. So limiting pest habitat, again, this one is uh, a key component would be sanitation, so destroying that crop debris. Utilizing tillage to make sure it doesn't persist in the environment uh, is important uh, because that's one way to build up the numbers. Uh, so in any general crop, you're gonna have some pests there. Uh, what we find though is often, it's not at a level that's too damaging. And we'll talk about that a little more. Um, so sanitation can be key to reducing those levels from year to year particularly. Uh, another thing we do is to limit weeds or volunteer plants around production areas. So the reason we want to do that, there are any number of weeds that can serve as host for insects. And so if we can reduce the amount of weeds that are present in our general environment, as well as volunteers. So if you grow a crop in a given area, uh, invariably, particularly if it's something that has a fruit that kind of reaches uh, horticultural maturity or maturity where the seed is actually able to grow, let's say like winter squash or something like that. Invariably, you're gonna have some that you leave behind in the field because uh, they don't meet the quality standard or things like that. And it's not unusual to see plants sprout up from those the next spring. Um, making sure that you remove those uh, and get rid of them, you know, till them under, means that you're reducing uh, habitat for those specific insects. And so actually doing some control of areas that maybe you aren't actively cropping, maybe you have cover crop in there or something of that nature, but still making sure to pull out those volunteer plants can be important. I mentioned it just a moment ago, row covers can play a, a role as well as insect screening. And uh, lastly, uh, crop rotations. And crop rotations I didn't want to spend just a moment on. Uh, what we're talking about when we say that is an avoid planting the same crop or crop families in succession. Uh, and the reason we do that is anytime you have a particular insect uh, that is in place uh, feeding on a crop and reproducing, if we keep placing that crop back in there time and time again, we see those levels and numbers of pests uh, go higher and higher. So suddenly a pest that maybe caused some damage but really wasn't a big concern suddenly becomes a very big concern because we created conditions that allow that population just to end up. So the key to uh, crop rotations is not just varying the specific crop, but also families. 
Uh, so for instance, if you've got um, broccoli planted in an area for this year, uh, you wouldn't want to see cabbage or kale uh, planted back in that area because although it's not the same crop, uh, it is a related crop. And so the basic rule is uh, the further away physically in distance or the greater the time between uh, repeats uh, between a crop or a crop family, the better. Um, so generally we would say at least one year away would be kind of the minimum. Sometimes we realize farmers have limited production area, so we may see uh, where they implement a good winter cover crop between two crops that are same or same family. Um, it's not the best ideal practice, um, but it is better than nothing, certainly. Uh, so anytime we can uh, encourage farmers to look at rotations, it's only going to yield good results uh, in regards to um, insect particularly, but it also helps with disease pressure and also helps on the cycle of nutrients. So not every crop has the same exact demands when it comes to nutrients. And so by varying what's there, we're less likely to see a dramatic drop in a particular nutrient. And so for all those reasons, uh, and even more, crop rotations make a lot of sense for implementation. So the second point we had mentioned was choosing planting activities to frustrate pests. Um, and some of this is relatively straightforward, like planting non-related crops near each other. So going back to cabbage and broccoli, if they're next door to each other, and we get an insect coming in on one of those, and it's building up levels, it can very easily move over to its relative uh, and wreak havoc there as well. So anytime we can interrupt plantings of related uh, crops with non-related crops, it makes a lot of sense. It can help prevent populations from moving over. Obviously, it's not always foolproof. Uh, insects do move, they can fly, they can crawl. So certainly uh, there's a limitation to how effective this can be, but it can be something that is useful. The other thing, we can do is play with the timing of our plant. Uh, and one of the ways we can do that, for instance, is with um, the squash beetle we see down there in, um, excuse me, cucumber beetle we see down there in the corner and the uh, yellow squash alternate to that. Uh, what we find is, you know, the cucumber beetle actually overwinters as an adult. And so the first generation, if it pops out of the ground and it's not finding any cucumber family host or cucurbitaceae host, uh, it's not going to build up a large, significant population. In fact, it may move on trying to find greener pastures. So if we're able to delay that first planting uh, a few weeks, we actually may miss the very first generation of that pest. And so what that does is we may actually have a planting in there that has the ability to grow without that pest pressure right off the bat. Now, obviously, it comes into markets, and, you know, can we – uh, afford to do that? You know, are we able to do that? It's a question. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, sometimes planting early, we can do exactly the same thing. Sometimes we see uh, some pests that uh, are showing up later in the season. So if that's the case, we can actually get a jump on the season, plant early, and avoid a pest generation. So just understanding when our pests are actually arriving out there in the production world uh, is one way we can adjust timing uh, for the betterment of the crop. The third point to mention, uh, luring pests away from the crop we're actually growing. Uh, generally, we refer to this as trap cropping. Um, it can be useful, but I think there's a lot of limitations with this, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Basically, what you do is you find a crop that is more attractive to a significant pest uh, than your main cash crop would be. And so for the uh, cucurbitaceae or cucurbits, uh, generally we look to uh, Blue Hubbard squash as kind of the poster child for that. Blue Hubbard squash is very attractive to a number of different cucurbit pests, uh, more so than most of the other cucurbit crops. Um, so we find that when we plant that, they'll attack that crop first. And so um, it's good if we have a highly effective control option that we can uh, employ to control those insects. Because if we don't, uh, then in my opinion, we just create a situation where it's the ideal environment to see those pests uh, just to reproduce and build numbers. Because again, this is a crop they're very happy on, they want to be there, and if we aren't able to control them, then all we did is basically uh, create a singles bar for all the insects. 
And so um, I think that with organic, although there are some ways we can employ trap crops in organic production that are effective, I think we have to be careful that we're not just attracting in pests and then allowing them to move over to our main crops. Um, so I do think there's some limitations to trap cropping, but I do think it can be a useful tool in certain situations. Fourth, I uh, want to talk on reducing the impact of injury. Already mentioned it, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. The healthier the plant, the less likely we're going to see insect predation actually have an effect on our yields or our quality. Uh, and in fact, the more stresses that are applied to the plant, the more likely we're to see a greater effect. So anytime we can have ha happy, healthy plants in place, uh, we're going to be benefiting ourselves. So making sure we get the basic production um, practices and knowledge in place before we start cropping is important. I want to mention biological control. Um, with insects, there have been a number of different biological control methods that have been uh, useful and are popular today. Um, and basically, there's a few kind of well, two main strategies that are utilized under biological control. The first is promoting natural enemies of our pest. Uh, and there's a number of different ways we can do that. Uh, and some of the simplest ways to do that is just planting uh, flowering um, plants within the production area. Uh, and they serve as nectar sources because lots of times some of the parasitic wasp and any of the other um, natural enemies actually need a nectar source in their adult form. So maybe it is the larval stage, for instance, that uh, attacks the pest, but the adults actually are feeding on nectar. So having flowering plants within the production area or nectar sources is important. Uh, refuge areas, these are areas that we're not actively treating uh, with insecticides. It allows a place for the uh, predators to actually kind of hang out, those natural enemies. We do have to be careful that the refuge areas don't become a reserve area for our pest. So there is a little bit of a balancing act with that. Uh, but again, doing some scouting, looking, and seeing what's actually present in those areas can help us determine if we have an issue there. And of course, using uh, pesticides properly. Um, <coughs> if we're using pesticides in the wrong manner, or maybe the wrong pesticide for the job, we can very easily not only affect uh, the pest in a negative way, but also beneficial uh, insects. So understanding when we need to uh, apply pesticides, the timing of day, understanding when we can choose a selective pesticide that's more targeted to specific pest rather than a broad spectrum pesticide is important to make sure we're promoting the health and well-being of the natural enemies that are there. Additionally, the second big category for biological control are insect pathogens. Uh, sometimes uh, people just refer to these as microbial pathogens, but these are bacterial, fungal, viruses, and nematodes. Uh, we'll lump nematodes into insects because they really don't fit anywhere else in the, uh, the pest world. Uh, and these are directly acting uh, on the uh, insects that are harmful. So for instance, uh, the picture there is actually uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, uh, that is commonly used on, uh, depending on the variety uh, or strain of the Bt, on Lepidopteran, so moth or butterfly pest, or Coleoptera, or beetle pest, as well as others. Uh, so uh, there's any number of naturally occurring bacteria, funguses, and viruses that we've been able to take and use uh, to control insects. And so we'll talk a little bit more about one of those uh, in a moment. Um, lastly, we want to talk about chemical control, uh, not because uh, it's the least important, but actually it should always be sort of uh, a reserve option uh, because uh, they're highly effective. They're the primary way, truthfully, that insects are controlled within commercial production. Uh, but it is important that we approach it in the right manner. So when we're talking chemical control, we're talking typically about utilizing insecticides. Uh, it, we will say that you know, there are some other uh, chemical strategies that are employed. Some of those are things like pheromones uh, because we can disrupt sometimes the breeding pattern of insects uh, by releasing pheromones into the production environment and things like that. But most often we're specifically looking at 
things that directly kill insects. It does require that we understand uh, several things in order to use these effectively. One of those is the target insect biology. So some of it goes back to which product is appropriate for which pest. Some of it goes to when do we apply that product, either in the life cycle of the insect or even time of day to get the greatest uh, effect. We also have to think about the mode of action. So are there ways that we apply insect insecticides that make them more or less effective? Uh, and of course, again, we'll mention it. You must always be aware of pollinators of those beneficial insects. Um, there are times when utilizing insecticides are the best option available to us, but there are ways to minimize the negative effects on pollinators or beneficial insects. And so we need to understand how to do that. For instance, with any number of insecticidal products, you will see uh, written on the labels or referenced in the literature about applying those at dusk uh, to a field. We do that because uh, by that point in time, most pollinators are not flying. And so it's a way to minimize the effect of that insecticide on potential pollinators. Um, and so understanding why that's on the label, understanding why you're directed to do that, I think is important to making sure that you actually follow that and comply with that requirement. I will say this, I always like to mention this while I'm talking about pesticides. Um, pesticides is a big umbrella term. It basically just means that you're controlling pests. So under pesticides, there's all the ones you see on the screen as well as a whole host of other ones. Uh, we're talking tonight about insecticides, or control, which control insects specifically. So just understand that when people use the term pesticide, generally it's a broad term that includes any number of different products. But tonight we're gonna to focus on insecticides and those that control insects. So one of the ways I think we can understand how to effectively use pesticides and actually look at an example. Uh, and this is actually looking at a BT spray or Bacillus thuringiensis, that bacterial spray. Uh, and we have to know how this actually kills uh, the caterpillar. Uh, and, it, and for instance, this specific product will only kill Lepidopteran pests. And Lepidopteran is just the order of insects that includes moths and butterflies. So we're talking about caterpillars. Um, this would not be effective on, say, for instance, beetles. There are BT sprays that are effective on beetles as well as other uh, classes of insects, but this one is specifically only good for Lepidopteran or caterpillar pests. The way this product actually works is you apply it to the plant and the caterpillar must eat the BT spray and actually ingest this uh, bacterial product uh, in order for it to be effective. And then once inside the uh, larva or the caterpillar, it actually forms a, a pesticide essentially within the gut of the caterpillar. So if we were spraying this, one, we're probably not gonna spray until one, we're finding eggs uh, upon scouting the plant. And the eggs are very small, so sometimes that's difficult to see. But what can be very obvious uh, is the flight of the imported uh, cabbage worm. Uh, you'll see the butterfly to the right, uh, that's actually the adult. Um, what's unusual about it is because it is a butterfly and not a moth, it flies during the daytime. So there are other uh, caterpillar pests of uh, brassicas, uh, such as broccoli, uh, that only fly at night. But when we see white butterflies flittering around the field, we know we're dealing with imported cabbage worm. And what's important to realize is once they start laying eggs, probably about four to five days after that, we'll start having caterpillars eating on our crop. And generally they're there uh, much earlier than the heading out stage that we see here. So paying attention and actually monitoring what we might start seeing butterflies flying during the day or moths at night can help us know when we need to spray for these caterpillar pests. And then remembering that the caterpillar has to eat this. And so the caterpillar is only present up in the canopy of that crop. And most often they're feeding on the underside of leaves. If you're a caterpillar, you don't wanna be up on top of that plant where a bird can get you uh, and see you easily or even other um, uh, predatory insects can find you. So most of the time you'll find them un on the underside of leaves. So we have to do a good job with our spray program to make sure we're placing BT where that caterpillar is actually gonna be. So when we understand all those factors of 
sort of the timing of when we spray, we're gonna wait until we start seeing either adults around or start seeing some damage, finding some caterpillars, and understanding that we have to get good coverage on that plant uh, before that caterpillar can eat it, helps us use these products effectively. And what I find interesting is, although uh, BT is typically thought of a more organic use insecticide, you see widespread adoption of it even in conventional agriculture because it is effective. Uh, it's most effective on young caterpillars, so we do want to have it applied while they're still young, so we do want to do a good job with monitoring uh, those fields. Um, but it is something that we see used not only in commercial vegetable, but even in tobacco production you'll find growers using it because one of the reasons is it's a good tool to help prevent uh, resistance in insects. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So one thing we always wanna do when we're dealing with pesticides, and particularly tonight insecticides, is reading the label. And I see I didn't update the, the slide on this. I should say insecticide rather than herbicide. Uh, but we always wanna read the label because the label is the law. So you'll probably hear that if you ever go to any sort of extension meeting and they're talking about utilizing any sort of pesticide, you'll hear the phrase, label is the law. What they're literally saying is that uh, we're bound whenever you, you're utilizing pesticides to follow all the directions that pertain to your situation um, in relationship to use, utilizing that product. So it's gonna talk about where you can spray it, how much you can spray it, what pests you can spray it for, uh, and what I like about a label is to me, it's giving me the direction so I know I can be successful, safe, as well as legal. Uh, because there are legal ramifications for misusing uh, pesticide products. Um, to me, you know, if you're not following label directions, uh, chances are you're not going to have as good a control as if you did uh, the proper activities. Uh, one thing that can happen is sometimes people think, well, if a little is good, then a lot should be better. In reality, sometimes when we start doing things like that, what we actually find is we find negative effects happening on that crop. We may see burning or other phytotoxic uh, or negative effects happening to that crop because um, quite simply, it was never intended to be applied at that high of a rate. So always follow all the directions uh, in regards to the label. Uh, and in fact, if you're not familiar with pesticide labels, uh, we'll mention a few things about them. There's a lot of information on labels, uh, and a lot of it's pretty straightforward, but sometimes you do have to dig. Uh, and so for instance, uh, there's part of a label, this is kind of like the front label that you'd find on uh, this particular product, but even one such as this, you'll actually find that the label is several pages long. Um, so it is sometimes difficult to find exactly which portion of it may apply to your situation. But taking a little time and doing that uh, is definitely in your benefit. Uh, and it's a great way to actually figure out, you know, is this going to be effective on my crop? Because uh, again, I always say that the producer of a pesticide wants you to have success. They want you to use their product and actually accomplish the goals that you're wanting. So making sure that you have a product that is suited for uh, your crop or where you're going to use it. For instance, there are some products that may not be labeled for use in greenhouses or high tunnels but are perfectly acceptable for use out in the field. So understanding those sorts of limitations is important. And if you're not very familiar with uh, pesticide labels, I'll mention one resource uh, later. I'd mentioned earlier about resistance management and resistance is basically just where a pest develops uh, the ability to uh, resist or not succumb to a pesticide. Um, there's different methodologies on how that can happen. Some of it can be actually avoidance where they basically, they don't like the pesticide. So if they come into the plant and they sense that the pesticide's there, they'll actually leave. They may move to a different part of the plant. They may move to a different part of the field or something like that. And so they actually just avoid it. There's other methodologies whereby uh, insects have the ability to actually use enzymes themselves and to counteract or neutralize uh, a pest control agent. So there's any number of different methodologies, but the way we deal with it and the way we approach it is to vary uh, the mode of action. Uh, or as we find them listed on the pesticide label, and I've highlighted this one in yellow, they're actually uh, placed into groups. And those groups relate to the way they act on the insect. 
And so there's a number of different groups. And so if you're utilizing just one product all season long, that's not the best plan for uh, resistance management. And basically when you do that, you're applying pressure to where if there is a couple of insects out there that for whatever reason is resistant to that product, you're just making the perfect environment for them just to keep uh, reproducing uh, without having any competition from susceptible insects. And so if you vary the mode of action or the group that an insecticide is in, what you find is uh, you're very less likely to have insects that have multiple uh, modes of resistance. So typically what we're doing by changing up uh, the mode of action or the group of the insecticide is we're actually preventing only developing a single uh, class of insects that has a particular resistance. So resistance is very real. It is something that I encourage people, even organic producers, uh, to look at implementing. It's not something that is only for our conventional growers, but varying the control, having more than one group insecticide uh, in the program is important. One concern that a lot of especially new growers have is how do I find insect control options for my crop? You know, where do I go for this? I don't want to read through 20 different labels to find the one that's going to let me control cucumber beetles on cucumbers. Um, what's good is we have a couple of very good resources from both Virginia and Kentucky. Those are the production manuals that are put out by Cooperative Extension. In Virginia, their manual is actually a cooperative effort with a number of mid-Atlantic states. Uh, and so here's just a screenshot of one section of it for insect pests related to uh, uh, brassicas or coal crops. Uh, you'll see it there. Similarly, we find the same sort of information in uh, the Kentucky version of their production manual. Uh, and uh, you'll see there's a little bit different information provided by each. I kind of like the mid-Atlantic one a little bit better, I like that it has pre-harvest intervals, which is how soon after spraying uh, can you harvest that crop, uh, as well as re-entry intervals later. I kind of like that information a little bit better, seeing that up front. Uh, but again, both of them do a very good job of uh, pointing you to both uh, potential control options, their rates, and as well as some restrictions that may be associated with them. I always mention uh, it is important to pay attention to any state specific information that may be listed there because in general um, most pesticide labels are the same from state to state but there are methodologies by which a state can approve what's called like a 24c label uh, which may allow for certain applications in one state but not another. Uh, we see those more in the uh, mid-Atlantic state where a, a manual where it may actually show a particular reference to a state for a certain allowance uh, for something and not other states. So if you do see state specific information, uh, that's why you see some differences. There. I also want to encourage folks uh, to take a look at becoming a private applicator or get your private applicator's pesticide license. Uh, both Virginia and Kentucky have programs that allow you to do this. Uh, you'll see the information there on the screen. If you don't have anything to take it down with now, it's something that you can, if you just Google for private applicator certification or even pesticide license followed by the state, uh, you should be able to find these resources again pretty easy. Uh, what a private applicator license does is basically uh, helps to train you and just confirms that you're able to read and understand those pesticide labels. And again, to me, that's very key uh, for making sure we're doing things in a proper manner. So I encourage any producer, uh, conventional or organic, uh, to go ahead and go through these processes. It's not difficult, it's not hard. Um, truthfully, if you can't pass the private applicator test, uh, you probably shouldn't be applying pesticides uh, because it is something that it's not intended to trip anyone up or prevent them from passing, but just making sure that folks can understand uh, the full implications of utilizing pesticide products. Uh, if you're a grower that's interested in GAP certification, uh, having an applicator license actually is one category that adds extra points. It's a question on there. It's not a requirement, but it's a way to add some points 
for very minimal cost. And again, I think it gives you some very useful tools to add to your toolbox. Uh, again, if you're not familiar with pesticide labels, uh, there are any number of different resources out there. Uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension had one publication that I liked, which is called Understanding Pesticide Labels. It's fairly straightforward, uh, kind of generic in a certain way, but I think that's good because again, pesticides, that big umbrella applies to not only insecticides, but also herbicides, fungicides, and all those others that were listed. But once you understand the basic process of what's on the label and where you can find information for your situation, uh, you'll find that it's fairly easy to dig that out. Uh, another great resource is uh, CDMS. Uh, they have a great um, label database. And so if you have a product that you've lost the label, because again, lots of times we're saying label, but it's not really a product label. It ends up being a booklet of 30 or 50 pages long. And so lots of times those get detached from the pesticide container and maybe you didn't have a copy of it in your office. But what's great is you can find it online quickly and easily. Uh, and it's also a great place if you're looking at maybe purchasing a particular uh, product, but you want to see, is that labeled for my crop? or just a pest I'm really wanting to target listed as one of the pests, you can do that easily. Uh, just going to their search uh, engine and using it, it's very good, it's very easy, uh, and it's something to, I think, have bookmark on your computer. Another thing I wanna mention is uh, sometimes, uh, and for good reason, uh, producers want to mix different pesticide products together, or maybe they wanna mix a pesticide with an application of a fertilizer or something like that. Uh, it's a way to prevent uh, you know, multiple trips over the field with the tractor and sprayer. It's perfectly allowable. There will sometimes be restrictions on a label saying you cannot mix a certain pesticide with another certain product. Of course, always follow that. But even in the absence of a specific restriction like that, we do want to have a little caution. And one of the ways we can do that is what's called a jar test tip. And I actually found this link, preparing pesticide tank mixes, uh, actually from uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, it goes back to actually their private applicator training program. I liked it. There's a number of different ones out there. I think any of them are useful, um, but I like the way this one was presented. But basically what you do is you kind of do a miniature test or a jar mixture to determine if uh, your planned mix in that tank is going to work. Because what can sometimes happen is you actually end up uh, creating some sort of particulate or solid uh, that forms because the different products you're adding together um, reacts with one another. And so the last thing you want to do is to clog up your sprayer or uh, have a problem in that sense. So there's kind of a step-by-step -step method on how you do a jar test. Again, there's a lot of different uh, walkthroughs on this out there. If you just put jar test pesticides, you can find them really quickly. So I don't think you have to use this exact reference, but I did like it. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're looking at mixing different types of products or different pesticides together. Perfectly acceptable and can work. Just follow all the label directions and look at doing that test uh, in a jar. Mentioned these earlier, already talked about them, but the commercial vegetable production guys I think are in indispensable for commercial growers. Uh, they show you, um, you know, again, common pest, common control agents you can use. It's really useful. Another good one I found through uh, the University of Kentucky are a series of scouting guides. Um, I haven't talked a lot about scouting with IPM and really it is kind of one of the cornerstones. Um, and one of the reasons I haven't talked a lot about it is with a lot of vegetable crops, I'm having difficulty finding uh, reliable economic thresholds. What in the world is economic threshold? When we're talking about in-grade pest management, we know there's always gonna be some level of pest out there in the crop. And what an economic threshold does is establish whenever we have X number of this pest per so many plants or whatever the given unit is, then we know it's economically viable for us to actually go out there and control them with a pesticide. Um, it basically equates uh, the pesticide level, the level of damage, and the cost of actually controlling it. The problem I find is I'm having a hard time getting a good source for those economic thresholds for vegetable crops. 
And I think some of it has to do just with the nature of vegetable crops. You know, is a slicer tomato, how do you really compare a slicer to a great tomato or a beefsteak tomato or things like that? So I think some of that is the complexity to it. I can occasionally find some older references, but it's hard to find those in the newer resources. So I'm beginning to think that maybe they're rethinking some of those levels. So if anybody has a really good resource that you use that has those economic thresholds for vegetable crops, I'd be happy to take a look at that. So uh, please feel free to send me an email. What I really like about these manuals is they are a great tool for scouting because they help with uh, identifying both insects as well as common diseases uh, of these uh, large groups of crops. So uh, if you're newer to a crop or maybe you haven't had an insect ID course or haven't been involved much with entomology, these are great tools. Uh, they're perfectly free. They're just PDFs online. You can print them out. Uh, they are really a go-to manual, I think, for especially beginning farmers, but even I like having these printed out and around because it helps me make sure I'm properly identifying things. I'm not confusing two things. Um, so they're really great to use. You can see the actual um, address that they're on your screen. Again, if you just search for UKY and vegetable IPM, it would probably pull it up for most any uh, search engine. But very good and very useful tools. And what I like about these, these are very modern and up-to-date, so the pictures are excellent. So sometimes looking at uh, certain resources or books, uh, you start to see maybe some of the uh, outdated or at least not current uh, technology for pictures. And sometimes you're not sure it's as clear as you'd like it to be. These have very good pictures in them, and I, I hope you'll take advantage of them. Another one that I really like, and this is one that has been updated, I think at least once since it was released. Uh, it is specifically for organic production, but I still think it has really good information in it, even if you're a conventional grower. Uh, it's the Resource Guide for Organic Insect and Disease Management. Uh, it is a effort of Cornell University, uh, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, as well as um, uh, the state of New York. And what's so good about it, I think, is it kind of has, it's split up into two different sections. One of those lists the common pests for any number of different crops. Um, the one caution I will give is some of the information is, spe is specifically for, unsurprisingly, the Northeast, uh, just because of who's authored it. So maybe some of the timing or number of generations or things of that nature may not be exactly correct, but the basic biology of the pest is going to be there. Uh, it lists some cultural control methods. It lists for uh, uh, additionally materials that can be used in organic applications, because again, that's the focus of this publication. Uh, but what I also like is it has a section for each uh, basically broad uh, class of insecticides. So I have the one on the screen for uh, BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. And so it talks about how the pesticides work and how they actually kill the insect talks about, you know, what's a way to effectively utilize uh, the pesticide. So again, um, it has a lot of great information. If you're wondering how do I effectively use certain products, uh, if you've read the label of that product and it doesn't really lead you to a clear conclusion, maybe looking at this resource, even if you're a conventional grower, I think is a good go-to guide because it does have such specific information and detailed information about both uh, insects as well as the control methods. Uh, so it's something that I consult from time to time and it's really a good tool to know about. But again, if you just look for uh, corn or search for Cornell Organic Insect Management, uh, most of the time it pops right.